Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. We've got the draw for the Preakness. We're ready for the second leg of the Triple Crown. Second leg of the Triple Crown, Matt. That's exciting. We don't have the Derby winner in there, but hey, they decided, much like Gata Del Sol's connections did, 40 years ago that uh, they're better off waiting for the Belmont. A little bit surprising to me, but, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, maybe we shouldn't be surprised after an 80-to-1 winner of the Kentucky Derby and a horse who clearly looks like he wants to go a distance. So we still have an interesting edition of the Preakness map. Let's put that draw up right now. You see the morning line from Pimlico, Matt. First question for you, was anything surprising about the morning line odds with this nine horse draw? Uh, there were some things, you know, that were uh, a little bit interesting. Uh, I, I had a question about some of the odds of some of, of one of the new shooters in comparison to a horse that ran in the Derby. Uh, but we can get to that. And, and maybe people have questions about Secret Oath being the third choice yeah I, I i do uh or she was listed as six to one in the kentucky oaks we both had her as our top pick matt i thought six to one was absolutely crazy she went off at 4.4 to one which i guess was kind of uh in a in a scrum for the second choice there i think she went off the third choice in the kentucky oaks i'm i'm a little surprised because i feel like she's not getting a little uh, uh, as much respect as she deserves but hey only better for us when they bet the horses we like less than we think they will. And maybe that'll be true here in the Preakness. You see nine horses, simplification, a good fourth in the Kentucky Derby on the rail, creative minister, one of the interesting new horses for the Preakness. At the two, Secret Oath drew the four, right outside her is early voting, Matt, the runner up in the Wood Memorial, seven to two, clear second uh, choice on the morning line. And of course, we have the eight at the center, six to five on the morning line. Matt, uh, does our talk about this Preakness begin and end? Is it as simple as saying it's at the center and everybody else? Well, according to the morning line maker, that is the case at six to five. That to me, I, I don't. To me, that feels a little bit short of a price that we're actually going to end up with on epicenter. But hey, I'm, I'm not a professional morning line maker, and maybe my feeling about how the race is going to go and who my top pick is is influencing that. Yeah, well, as handicappers and as betters, we have to uh, look for value a little bit. Um, if, if sometimes we have two horses that are close on our feelings and one horse is is way lower than the other of course we're going to go with the horse with better odds i actually think you know the, the job of the morning line maker is not to handicap the race the minor the, the, the job of the morning line maker is to predict where these horses are going to be bad how they're going to be bad and where they're going to go off when the gates spring open and I, and I actually think this morning line makes some sense for epicenter in fact matt I'm on the other end. I, I think Epicenter could be even lower than six to five. Uh, it's been 40 years since Linkage was a, uh, a non-winner of the Kentucky Derby, a non-starter in the Kentucky Derby, went off at one to two, same year that Gata Del Sol skipped the Preakness. I think Epicenter is destined to be the lowest non-Kentucky Derby winner since Linkage, and I could see him at even money or less, maybe even four to five in this Preakness. We'll see. Let's talk about Epicenter a little bit more. Really good performance, Matt, I thought, in the Derby. And I think everybody agrees because it was a very fast pace. Joel Rosario did the right thing, took him just off that fast pace. It says he was eighth early, but he was only about five lengths off that crazy, crazy fast pace in the Kentucky Derby. He ran a good race, especially down the stretch when he would not let Zandon by. Yeah, he ran a great race, Brian. He you know, in my eyes, and and, and I have been a big uh, Epicenter fan uh, and still am uh, heading into the Derby, after the Derby. He did everything he was supposed to do in the Derby. Like you said, Brian, sat fairly close to that to that fast pace and was the was the survivor of pressing that pace. He handled all of the horses that he thought that he needed to handle. And, and when I say he, I mean 
Epicenter and Joel Rosario and Steve Asmussen and absolutely looked like a winner uh, going down the stretch. I was I was uh, uh, cashing my trifecta ticket at that point and and my two day daily double uh, uh, Oaks Derby daily double at that point and then along came uh, Rich Strike to 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 ruin the party. Uh, but yeah, getting back to what you said. Six to five, or maybe even shorter in your eyes, and you're better at morning line stuff than I am, Bry. Uh, um, makes me have to wonder, you know, a little bit. It, it, it's been a pretty long campaign going back to November for Epicenter, running almost every month or or six weeks at the most between races. The Derby, ten furlongs. Uh, 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 Contesting that early pace, put, turning away horses, is eventually that going to take a toll on a horse? And that horse being epicenter, for me, at six to five or less, I got to look to other horses, even though I have so much respect for epicenter. Yeah, and I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I, I was on the other end of the spectrum, hoping Epicenter faded a little bit more because I had Zandon with with Rich Strike and Simplification and and Epicenter holding on so well kind of beat me there, Matt. But uh, it was a very tough race. It's been a long campaign for Epicenter, an excellent campaign where he's improved. He's won races like the Risen Star and the Louisiana Derby impressively. He ran a great derby. But yeah, you do you you do have to wonder, and the and and these are things that we take into consideration when we're trying to beat a horse at six to five, or maybe even possibly lower in a race like the Preakness. Uh, the Derby was a tough race for Epicenter. Meanwhile, uh, the second choice on the morning line, early voting, did not have a tough race on Kentucky Derby weekend. He he didn't run. He was resting after running a good Wood Memorial four weeks before that. And uh, the, the other horse who probably will vie for second choice, Secret Oath, uh, she was uh, running the day before in the Kentucky Oaks and probably had a, an easier race than uh, Epicenter. Maybe there is reason to think Epicenter will uh, move just a step down after that big performance. And again, we're, we're talking about a horse six to five or lower. Maybe we do take a chance. Next on the morning line, though, it's not the Philly, not the Kentucky Oaks winner. Matt, as we said, it's early voting. Early voting, uh, him of three races. It looks like Chad Brown is really trying to uh, have history repeat itself because Cloud Computing came into the Preakness, a rested fresh horse off of only three lifetime races. And, of course, he upset Always Dreaming, the Derby winner, and uh, uh, Classic Empire, the two-year-old champion in that Preakness. Uh, it, it looks like they're just looking to repeat themselves as far as uh, five years later, bringing a horse who skipped the Derby, has three lifetime races, ran in the Wood Memorial. Chad Brown, can he do it again with this cult? Hey, why not? Like you said, all of those things are great indicators of success. And, and early voting looked very good uh, in the Wood Memorial. He got out there, set the pace uh, in, the, in the Wood Memorial. And, uh, and and had the lead going down the stretch in the Wood Memorial, only to be run down by Mo Donegal uh, uh, coming down the stretch to get the win. Uh, it seems like in the Preakness, that will be the strategy with early voting again, to get out of the gate, get to the lead, and, and try and take this race on the front end. But it looks like to me in this field, He's going to have a little bit com of company out there, maybe a little bit more company than he had in the Wood Memorial. Yeah, he, he wired the Withers in, in, back in February. It wasn't a strong edition of the Withers. Uh, and then Mo Donegal ran him down in the Wood Memorial, but he ran a good race to be second, clearly second, well ahead of everybody else. Uh, but he's shown speed all, all you know, all, all the time. He's shown a lot of speed in the Withers and the Wood Memorial. So it would be hard to imagine them taking him out of his game now uh, but last time we spoke about the Preakness map, we didn't expect uh, a, a lot of speed in here. But I think what we did get with a couple of later additions to this field is maybe some cheap speed. And cheap speed, you say, well, so what? But on the other hand, cheap speed, what they can do for the first four furlongs, and you saw that in the Kentucky Derby for sure, not to put down the uh, the international summers tomorrow, but you saw a horse who really had no chance to win, but 
change the dynamic of that Kentucky Derby. Certainly, we're not talking about a pace that we saw in the Kentucky Derby here, but I think all of a sudden with the addition of horses like Fenwick and uh, Armagnac uh, and, and possibly simplification drawing the rail even, Matt, there, there could be more speed than we thought. That could be five horses who at least have the ability, I'm of course in counting early voting and at the center to that list, who at least have the ability to press the pace. And therefore, maybe early voting's uh, easy pace in the Preakness has now become a tougher job. He couldn't hold off Mo Donegal uh, in the Wood Memorial. Is he going to be able to hold off horses like Epicenter and Secret Oath going farther in the Preakness? Yeah, that's one of the intriguing, maybe the most intriguing question, the most important question uh, in this race. And of course, he's going to have to go an extra 16th of a mile uh, in the Preakness. And, and, and it seems like with the names of the horses that you mentioned that have the potential to be out there pressing the pace, that at least some of them are going to do that. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and, you know, we're not uh, saying that horses like Fenwick, especially, and maybe Armagnac, uh, are, are going to be horses that can stick around and pressure uh, early voting for a mile or more. But if they go out fast, if they decide that's their best chance to run a good race in the Preakness by going out to the early lead, that affects the race, that affects the pace, that affects the ability of early voting to relax early, and that affects his chances to win. So for those reasons, I, I think I'm liking early voting just a little bit less than I, I thought I did a, a week ago. Um, he's got to improve off the Wood Memorial because if he couldn't hold off Mo Donegal in that situation, I don't think he can hold off Epicenter or Secret Oath here unless he improves. But now he could improve, but still have more pace pressure than he saw in either the Withers, for sure, and the Wood Memorial, and that makes his job tougher. Looking back at the list, Matt, next horse, of course, is Secret Oath, the number four. Um, I've heard D. Wayne Lucas said say this, and this is kind of what I've been thinking for a long time. This is a filly that the Preakness kind of makes sense for us. Sometimes we forget that the Preakness at a mile three sixteenths is not a speed dominated race for certain. Uh, often the Preakness is won by a, a horse like Cloud Computing who could, who can be in the picture uh, on the turn and, and, and be nimble enough to uh, make a move that puts you in position as they straighten out. And if there's any backup from the, uh, from the speed horses, that can easily go on to win the Preakness. Secret Oath is a good example of that because she's got a very big turn of foot and she has proven nimble in races. So I'm, I'm almost thinking now, a, a little opposed to a week ago, this race sets up pretty darn well for Secret Oath, the filly, to beat the boys in the Preakness. I agree with you, Brian. I agree with what you said about early voting. I, too, maybe like him a little bit less than I thought I was going to. Um, and, and Secret Oath coming out of the Kentucky Oaks, you can only be super impressed by that effort and, and how she did it against a very good field brian if you remember when we when we were analyzing the oaks we talked about what a strong field it was the big four in there and and she handled them easily she had a perfect trip in the race she won going away when she put when she turned on that uh, that's that turn of foot uh making her move and got to the lead so easily to me it was a victory that probably took very little out of her heading into the Preakness on just two, way, two weeks rest. Yeah, I agree. And, and Lucas said right after the race that she was barely blowing hard after the Kentucky Oaks. That was a good sign right away for me that they were going to, in fact, run her in the Preakness. And sure enough, soon after we found out that they will be running her in the Preakness. Um, I, you know, I've been watching her races literally since she won a maiden race at Churchill last year. And she... She just can get to places that a lot of horses can't, and she can do it suddenly, and she can close in on the leaders and take the lead quickly. We certainly saw that in races like the Honey Bee and the uh, Martha Washington. We're seeing some horses run well that she beat in the allowance race uh, uh, December 31 last year, that Matera has become a dynamite uh, one-turn horse, and that's a horse uh, that Secret Oath just dominated in an allowance race at the end of last year. I think Phillies tend to be overlooked a little bit when they face the males, but you're right. 
the Kentucky Oaks might have been a deeper race than the Preakness. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that there were any epicenters in that Kentucky Oaks, of course, but for depth of quality, that Kentucky Oaks was a really, really good field. And now I think she has a big shot in the Preakness. Now, next on the list is Simplification. And another horse that that uh, I've been talking about for a while, you've liked for sure as well. He drew the rail. He gets a rider change, almost a forced rider change, because Jose Ortiz is sticking with Brown and early voting. But Simplification picks up Johnny Velasquez, one of the best big race riders we've seen in the last couple of decades. Simplification ran a very good race in the Preakness. But as is his M.O., he's kind of bouncing back and forth between close to the pace and off the pace. In the Derby, maybe it was a little forced where he was bothered a little bit at the start. But he was pretty far back early, pretty wide throughout the race, beaten just over three lengths, a very good fourth place finish for the Antonio Sano train simplification. Yeah, Brian, and you've heard me say, and the Horse Center fans have heard me say on the show so many times, hey, I'm not a really a post position guy, but yeah, the post position draw for simplification, getting the one hole is a difficult one for sure. I'm not saying that it's necessarily bad, but it's a difficult one. It, it, it forces the connections to kind of, you know, make a decision about, you know, how they're going to deal with the rail. Uh, are they going to use simplification speed that we've seen on a couple of instances to get out of there and be in contention? Or are they just going to take it easy on the rail and, and, and see where they end up? I, I think if they take it easy and we talked about, you know, four or five horses with speed that once again, simplification could end up maybe a little farther back than they want to. So, in my eyes, they have to make a decision. I, 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 and for me, either one of those decisions doesn't seem to be optimal for simplification in the Preakness. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's one scenario that I could see working out really well where Johnny V decides that there is speed and he's, he sits in fifth early on the rail. He saves ground and things open up for him. That's possible, but I agree with you. I, I think it is a little bit of a tough position, post position that he drew on the rail, and I think it does uh, it, it does make me wonder whether we've seen we've seen Johnny V do it with horses that have won classic races recently, where Johnny V rides hard out of the starting gate to get in good position. He could do that with simplification. That could happen on Saturday, and and that of course would add to the speed that we're talking about. Now, let me ask you this: Is there a blowback? Is there a is there a reaction to the overly fast pace in the Kentucky Derby that we'll see in the Preakness, or is it just a new race where riders will ride the best that they think they can and not overreact the other way and say, "Oh, we got to slow down early and make sure what happens in the Kentucky Derby doesn't happen here in the Preakness." No, I I, th I think it's a new uh, it's a new race in here, and and particularly we're talking about uh, early voting being the speed horse of note. Uh, we already know that early voting is a horse that can carry his speed a lot farther in distance than uh, uh, summer is tomorrow did in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, although if early voting had set those kind of uh, contested fractions. Uh, I don't think he would have been around at all in the Kentucky Derby year either, Matt. Easy for me to say. Uh, yeah, simplification is a horse I've liked uh, for a long time. I just don't know whether I see him winning this Preakness. I, I, don't, I don't see a great scenario where simplification all of a sudden beats Epicenter and beats some of the other interesting new horses here. Uh, a horse that you have to use in your exotics, but uh, I'm not picking simplification for the win. Uh, a horse who might be a little bit interest, more interesting for the win spot, Matt, is the two, Creative Minister. This is a well-bred son of Creative Cause uh, out of a, out of a well-bred dam, a well-bred uh, daughter of Tappet, who uh, is a full sister to Tapazar. So Creative Minister has the pedigree to go a distance. He has the pedigree to be a good horse. It looks like if you're looking at his progression and looking at his three starts, Creative Minister is a graded stakes horse waiting to happen. Yeah, it looks that way. And he clearly is a horse on the improve. He's had three career races now, all coming since uh, the beginning of March. Um, he, he began his career with just a narrow neck loss in a maiden special weight, moved on to Keeneland where he broke his maiden and then on to Churchill Downs on the Kentucky Derby uh, undercard. So he's another horse 
uh, that is coming back in two weeks, like the Derby Horses, like Secret Oath um, from the Oaks, and got a very nice allowance victory um, at Churchill Downs. Uh, yes, uh, a, a, a clear, improving progression. No matter how you want to look at it, Brian, uh, competition, uh, speed figures, everything is getting better. Uh, the connections, trainer Kenny McPeak and the owners uh, uh, saw enough so that they are willing to put up a $150,000 supplemental fee to get into the race. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of confidence that they're showing in their young horse. And yeah, if you, if you look at it just from the standpoint of how well he ran in these races, he's very comparable to early voting. The difference, of course, is early voting ran in a graded stakes in the Withers and then ran in a very good graded stakes in the Wood Memorial, while uh, Creative Minister has never before been in a stakes race even. But uh, I tell you what, the quality of that uh, uh, high purse allowance race on Kentucky Derby Day is pretty darn good. He sat on the rail. BJ Hernandez uh, took him, swung him wide for the drive confidently and he mowed them down and uh, won like a good looking horse. He's also proven that he can pass horses, Matt Schiffman. And I think that's something that I like here in this field. So creative minister, definitely an interesting new arrival for the Triple Crown. Armagnac, I'm not so sure about. I, I'm not so sure how to say his name. I, I often struggle. I hope everybody gets a kick out of me pronouncing or mispronouncing horses' names over the years on Horse Center. But Armagnac is less of an interesting horse for me. At 12 to 1, 10 to 1, it, it seems like there should be a much bigger difference between Creative Minister and Armagnac. Uh, I don't like Armagnac because when he tried graded stakes horses, he proved that he was not in, in, in their class and he tried it a couple times. Yeah, maybe he's approving and maybe he showed that with an allowance win last time. But uh, I don't see the uh, morning line 10 to 1, 12 to 1. I don't, in my mind, those horses are not nearly so close in their chances to win on Saturday in the Preakness. Yeah, Brian, and I'll throw in there. You uh, uh, mentioned when Armagnac uh, uh, moved up to uh, Graded Stakes Company on the Kentucky Derby Trail at Santa Anita that he didn't fare well. In actuality, Brian, both times he finished behind Happy Jack, who is in this Preakness field, who ran in, you know, the Kentucky Derby. And Armagnac is at 30 to 1 on the morning line. So I, I see a little bit of a discrepancy there. Yes, that recent allowance race uh, uh, looks good in the PPs. The, the, the one there for the win looks good in the PPs. But, you know, he's in a tough spot here for a horse that, uh, uh, prefers to race on the, on the lead, and and both of his wins came when he was uh, racing with Lasix. He's not going to be able to do that here. He, he's lost pretty soundly when he has been off Lasix again. Maybe that was just because he moved into Stakes Company. But yeah, I, I I don't like him on the on the win end, but I do see him as being a pace factor. Right, right. I had talked about cheap early speed, and this is one of the horses I was talking about, cheap early speed. When I say cheap early speed, obviously, you know, I don't like them uh, for the for the top spots here in the Preakness. Uh, the, the other one being Fenwick, the three. And to tell you the truth, I don't have a huge gap in my mind between how good Armagnac looked in winning that recent Santa Anita allowance race, which was just uh, the previous Sunday, the day after the Derby. So he's coming back quickly, shipping across country, running farther than he ever has before. And all of a sudden trying to turn the tables on his poor performances, as you said, finishing behind long shot, happy Jack twice. Uh, and, and Fenwick's maiden win because Fenwick's maiden win at Tampa Bay. It was two, two starts ago. was pretty impressive on the lead. Clearly these horses are better on the lead, Fenwick and Armagnac, than coming from off the pace. Fenwick could never get to the lead in the bluegrass and backed out badly. That's why he's 50 to 1 in here. But I think either uh, are, are a threat to uh, make themselves known and add to the Preakness pace. I don't like either one. I'm guessing that you're not on the Fenwick, Fenwick bandwagon as well. No, I'm not, Brian, but I also want to add about Fenwick, who you, who you pointed out is 50 to 1. Um, yeah, he didn't break his maiden until his fifth try, but I just want to add also that maiden victory, if, if you look at those PPs carefully, 
that uh, maiden special weight victory came over command performance, a horse who had a lot of promise as a two-year-old for Todd Pletcher. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that maiden win at Tampa was good. Um, but again, we're, we're not saying Fenwick is anything but a pace factor here in the Preakness, I, I, I think. Looking at the rest of the field, we already mentioned Happy Jack a little bit, Matt. Uh, they keep trying, and, and, and I keep hearing Doug O'Neill say, well, Oxbow won the Preakness, and Happy Jack is a son of Oxbow. I don't think that's enough for me to all of a sudden feel like he can do better than he did in any of those stakes in California and the Kentucky Derby, where he never really was a factor at all. Yeah, you know, early on in my handicapping of the race, I kept thinking, boy, you know, look, let me look for, you know, any long shots that might get in there. And I and I kept looking at Happy Jack. But then, you know, the bottom of the line for me with Happy Jack, Brian, was that, you know, in, in his in his most recent races, uh, he's just been getting whooped, Brian, you know, every time. He's lost by more by by double digits, and some of them significantly. You know, if I'd seen a little bit more uh, uh, competitiveness, I might be more interested in Happy Jack, or even a or even a mood move that that, yeah. that ultimately yeah. fades. He's he's just not really competitive in these races, and and I, I kind of feel for the horse being in the Preakness two weeks after his pretty poor performance in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, over bet, extremely over bet. I think people love the name Happy Jack, and he was bet down to 23 to 1 below a lot of horses, like Simplification, for instance, at 35 to 1. That's kind of crazy to me. And uh, yeah, it's hard to like Happy Jack off recent form. It's a little bit more interesting, though, looking at the form of Skippy Longstocking. He, he used to be a horse who showed some speed, showed some flashes of talent. But he was doing it mainly on or near the lead early on. But in his last two, he rallied a little bit, Matt. And, and I like the allowance win at Gulfstream Park. And, and I, I think the, the Wood Memorial was not bad. He was clearly third best. Wide trip. Uh, he kept running in the stretch. He was gaining slightly down the lane. Is Skippy Longstocking the one real long shot in here that may be eligible to get into the exotics? Well, he's going to have the odds for sure. And you mentioned that third in the Wood Memorial. It was behind uh, It was behind early voting, the, the second choice in this Preakness. And it was behind Mo Donegal, who ran very well to be fifth in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, he seems like a horse who's getting better, who, who's getting better now that he's uh, off the pace. And as a son of exaggerator, I could see him developing into a nice nine and a half, ten furlong horse, nine and a half furlongs, I would I would only say that on Preakness Day, but anyway, yeah, he's a horse I think we could uh, think about, at least for rallying into the exotics on Saturday, or at least that's true. Matt, I want to, uh, after after our Preakness uh, rundown of the field here, I want to first get into top picks. Tell me who your top pick is on Saturday for the Preakness. My top pick is Secret Oath, and, and it it's for all of the reasons that you and I have talked about uh, in the show already. Uh, Secret Oath uh, had such an impressive Oaks victory that I think he can, she can move ahead from and didn't take a lot out of her. And Brian, quite frankly, I love the, the idea that she might be the third choice. I love it too, man. And you, you've surprised me. You honestly have. After so many years of working on the show together, I often kind of have a feeling who you might go for. And you surprised me a little bit in the Kentucky Oaks when you stood with Secret Oath strongly and you surprised me again. I, I, I did not expect you to make her your top pick in the Preakness. Folks, this is a horse who I had, I had number one above all the Colts earlier in the year on my uh, uh, NTRA ratings. I've, I've, I've really been on Secret Oath's bandwagon. I'm rooting for her, yes, but besides that, I really do believe that this filly can win the Preakness, and in fact, she will win the Preakness. She's my top pick as well, Matt. So once again, just like the Kentucky Oaks, we're both on Secret Oaks, and we both like the morning line. The morning line is good news for us. Speaking of morning line, Matt, let's talk wagers. What's your suggested wager for the Horse Center fans here for the Preakness? Hey, Brian, for me, it's all about secret oath, Brian. You know, uh, I, I, I'm looking for the, value, the, the best value. And for me in the Preakness, it's all about secret oath. 
I like those odds. For me, it's hard to really have confidence in anything else in the Preakness field. So I'm going back to my two-day uh, daily double. The, and, and, and on Preakness weekend, that combines the Black Eyed season on Friday with the Preakness on Saturday. I'm going to do $10 daily doubles. I am going to use six horses from the Black Eyed Susan. It's a big field. It's a full field in my eyes. It's a wide open field. It's a field that could produce a decent price on top. So I've got six horses. They're on the screen for you uh, folks. And I am going to use those six horses with secret oath and only secret oath in the pre. Secret oath and only secret oath, Matt. I love it. Um, I, I worry that even with six horses, you might not win the Black Eyed Susan. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That 13 horse field on Friday is a wide open race. Adair Manor will be the favorite. Adair Manor, who you have on your list there, will be uh, 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 the horse to beat on past performances. But I think she is beatable coming across the country. Running for uh, a, a new trainer, not Bob Baffert, of course. And uh, there is speed in this field. There's 13 horses. There's several speed horses in here. And, and Adair Maynard does her best running on a lead. I could see a long shot winner of this. I'm glad you have Luna Bell. Luna Bell with an E at the end, Matt. Luna Bell uh, has been a real, real monster uh, at Laurel on the Maryland circuit. And I would love to see her win. And I think she's got a pretty good chance. But it's a wide open field. There will be a couple of long shots I'll mention that Matt doesn't have, and maybe Matt will add them after I suggest that Radio Day stretching out to two turns. The daughter of Gunrunner could love the two-turn stretch out, and I think she's a talented filly for Shug McGahee that could run a big race. And I really like Favor as well. They both, unfortunately, have an outside post outside the 10, Adair Manor, the favorite. But I think Favor is a filly that's getting better for trainer Todd Fletcher, ran a good race. Last time went third behind uh, Echo Zulu in the Fairground Oaks. And I think Favor has a shot in here as well. I see a lot of speed, and, and I think that makes the favorite beatable in the, uh, the Black Eyed Susan. And Matt has a, a lot of good uh, fillies on his list that could win the race. But uh, Luna, Luna Bell, don't forget about Radio Days and Favor is what I'm saying. Let's jump to my picks, Matt. Uh, I'm a little bit more complicated. I, I, I'm a complicated guy generally. Actually, they're not that complicated. I am also, I'm going to say the same thing you said, Matt. Secret Oath and only Secret Oath. I want Secret Oath to win this Preakness. I want her to do so at 4-1. to one. I'm hoping she's 4-1 to one like she was in the Oaks. I'm going to use a $20 exacto with the horse to beat underneath her. That's Secret Oath on top of Epicenter. I've decided that the horse I like third best in the Preakness is Creative Minister coming from a little bit off the pace with B.J. Hernandez. I think he's getting good, will like the distance, and can pick up horses in the stretch. So that's a $5 exacta. And then I'm looking for some odds in my trifecta key. Yes, I am using Epicenter and Creative Minister under Secret Oath, but I'll also be using Simplification, who I could see higher than 6-1. to one. Early voting, I'm throwing in as kind of a saver. I don't like him at those seven to two morning lots. And Skippy Longstocking is my long shot. So that five horses underneath Secret Oath for both second and third, two dollar trifecta key would cost you forty dollars. What do you think about that, Matt? Hey, it looks good to me, Brian. I see you got you're you're using Epicenter. You don't want to get beat by Epicenter in here uh, uh, again uh, in in the Preakness. So you know, hey. We're all about secret oath in here, Brian, as she tries to become the seventh filly to win the Preakness and 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 the the third filly to win uh, this century, as uh, as Coach D Wayne Lucas uh, can tries to continue to add to his historic career. Yeah, historic career. Eighty six years old, Matt. It's kind of come full circle for me because I didn't know he would have horses this good at this age, certainly, who could know that? But the first time I ever heard of D. Wayne Lucas was literally 42 years ago at the Preakness when he brought a uh, an interesting horse from California, a, a horse who was getting good at the right time after kind of struggling with his career early on. His name was Codex. I'd never heard of D. Wayne Lucas before 1980s Preakness. And uh, uh, Codex came and, 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 and of course, Angel Cordero, uh, rode him to a very questionable ride and they beat the Philly 
D. Wayne Lucas and Angel Cordero and Codex Beat Genuine Risk, The Darling. And now it's come full circle 42 years later. Maybe the last great horse D. Wayne Lucas will train. Secret Oath, he, he's on the filly this time now. And I, I just think that's very interesting what's, uh, what's happened 42 years ago till now because we are both on D. Wayne Lucas, on the filly here in the Preakness. Let, it, let me get a party shot from you, my friend. Yeah. Hey, you know, you know talking about Secret Oath in here and, and all the history involved to me makes uh, uh, the Preakness an exciting race to watch. And, and Horse Center fans, thank you for watching the show. We'll see you next week uh, when we have our Preakness recap. Yeah, Preakness recap. We'll, we'll, we'll throw in a little bum on stakes, Matt. I think we should start talking about the Met Mile soon as well. Something to look forward to. Folks, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here at HRN, please do so now. We also want to thank Candace Curtis for the great race graphics and the best contest site out there. That's our sponsor, Derby Wars. Thank you to all. We'll be back right here next week on another edition of Horse Center. See you then, folks. Good luck in the Preakness.